So that was a recap of how we can use the IBM models to derive these alignments on training data sentences. In reality, though, there are two problems. Firstly, these alignments are often rather noisy. So although much of these alignments look good, they, are, uh, they often contain noise or erroneous alignments. And secondly, these alignments are many to one. What I mean by that is that each word in the foreign language is aligned to exactly one word in the um, English language. Okay, so we may have, if we think about the English and the foreign languages, each word on the foreign side is aligned to exactly one uh, word on the English side. So many words on this side may, may be aligned to one word on this side, but we certainly can't, for example, have a particular English word, or we can't have alignments like this, where multiple uh, English words are aligned to the same uh, foreign word. This is ruled out. We have the constraint that each foreign word is aligned to exactly one English word. And this isn't necessarily realistic. In many examples, you'll find that this constraint is not realistic. So a number of heuristics have been developed to try to get around these kind of problems. Um, firstly, to try to make these alignments more robust, to somehow reduce the noise. And secondly, to somehow get around this constraint that the, the, the alignments are many to one. And in particular, to try to move to alignments which are many to many. So we might, for example, have alignments like this, where some foreign words are aligned to multiple English words, and similarly, some English words are aligned to multiple French words. So th here's how this is generally done. The trick is that um, we can make the observation that the IBM models can be trained in both directions. So we can train a model for the conditional probability of a French sentence given the English. This is what we've seen so far. But I can also just reverse the two languages and train a model for English given French. And we can find the most likely alignment under each of these models in each of these two directions. And now we're going to have two different alignments for each tra training example. And the intersection of these alignments turns out to be a very reliable starting point for um, the alignment process. Let me illustrate this with a, an example. So here um, is the sentence pair we've seen earlier, the Spanish sentence and the English sentence. So F in this case is Spanish. This is the foreign string. And E is English. And this is the alignment I showed you earlier, derived from an IBM 2 model of F given E. So notice that this satisfies the constraint that each foreign word is aligned to a single English word. There's a single uh, point in each of these columns specifying the alignment for each of the foreign words. Here's the alignment from the reverse model. So I can train an IBM model 2 model for this language pair, but going in the opposite direction where I model the conditional probability of the English given the Spanish. And from that, I can again derive the most likely alignment. And now notice that this uh, alignment has the constraint that each English word is aligned to a single Spanish word. So if I look at any row of this matrix, there's a single dot in each row specifying the Spanish word that um, this English word was aligned to. So these are the two alignments. Now we can consider the intersection of these two alignments. So certain alignment points, for example this one, are seen in both alignments and they constitute the uh, intersection. So there's this one here, this one here. If we look further we see this one is also in both alignments. This one is in both alignments. This one is and this one is. So some su subset of the points in these two alignments are going to be seen in both and that subset is the um, quotes intersected alignment. Okay. Now in practice, what has been found is that these intersected alignments tend to be quite reliable, and so they're very useful. Um, they're a very useful starting point for a process which is then going to grow the alignments. Okay, so what we'll see next is that we'll see a process that considers. We put a cross by all the points 
which are not seen in both uh, alignments. Let me just circle these. Okay, so these circled points are in both alignments. And then there are some points which are in neither alignment. These one, two, three, four points, sorry, are in one alignment but not the other alignment. Okay. So what we'll see is that there are methods which basically start with these intersected alignments and start adding back in some of these points. So I don't want to go into detail about how this process works, um, but let me give you um, a sketch of this. Um, we only explore uh, alignment points which occur in one alignment or the other alignment. We add one alignment point at a time. We only add alignment points which align a word that currently has no alignment. And at first, we restrict ourselves to alignment points that are neighbors, they're adjacent or diagonal of the current alignment points. I'll try to post a uh, link to some papers on this process if you want to read about it in more detail in the class. But here's uh, an example of the kind of final alignment you might get using these heuristics which start with the intersect the alignment and then add in some points in the union of these two alignments. Okay, um, So this is our final alignment matrix. And notice that the alignment is no longer many to one. Okay, There are some English words which are aligned to multiple Spanish words. And similarly, there are some Spanish words that are aligned to multiple uh, English words. So to recap, the motivation for this is these two problems. One, that our alignments are often noisy, and two, that they're many to one. And what we now have, hopefully, is a set of many to many alignments, which are more reliable than taking alignments from simply one direction or one model, PFE or PEF alone.